from Boston, Massachusetts. It's the Cube covering IFS World Conference 2019. Brought to you by IFS. Hi, everybody. Welcome to Boston. You're watching the Cube's coverage of IFS World in the Heinz uh, Auditorium in Boston. I'm Dave Vellante with my co-host Paul Gillen. Paul, this is the uh, the largest enterprise resource planning software company that our audience probably has never heard of. This is our second year covering uh, IFS World. Last year was in Atlanta, they moved to Boston. IFS is a Swedish-based company. Uh, they do about $600 million in annual revenue, about 3,700 employees. Uh, and interestingly, they have a development center in Sri Lanka, of all places, which is kind of was war-torn for the last you know, 15 years or so, but, uh, but nonetheless, evidently a lot of talent and, uh, and beautiful views, but uh, so, welcome. Thank you, Dave. I, I have to admit, before our coverage last year, I'd never even heard of this company. Been around this industry for more than 30 years. Never heard of this company. They've got 10,000 customers. Uh, they've got a, a full house uh, next door in, in the keynote, and a very enthusiastic group. This is a focus company. It's a company that has a lot of um, a vision about where it wants to go, some impressive vision documents, and uh, really a company that I think is coming out of the shadows in the U.S. and, and is, will be forced to be reckoned with. So as I say, they were founded in the, in the mid-1980s, and then they kind of re-architected their whole platform around client server. You remember the component move? It was a sort of big trends in the, in the 90s. And in the mid-90s opened up offices in the United States. We're going to talk to the head of uh, North America later, and that's one of the, the big growth areas. They're growing at about three, they claim to be growing at 3x the overall market rate, which is a good benchmark. They're really, their focus is really three areas, ERP, asset management software, and, and field service management. And they talk about deep functionality. So, for instance, uh, well they compete with Oracle, SAP, yep. uh, certainly Microsoft, and, and, and Infor, a company we've covered, Infor talks a lot about the last mile functionality. That's not terminology that IFS uses, but they do similar types of things. I'll, I'll, I'll give you some examples, uh, because okay, what's last mile functionality? Things like um, you know, detailed invoicing integration, contract management, very narrow search results on things like, re I just want to search for refurbished parts, so they have functionality to allow you to do that. Chain of custody, uh, custody chain of custody for handling dangerous uh, toxic chemicals. Uh, certain uh, modules to handle FDA compliance. So real kind of nitty gritty stuff to help companies avoid custom modifications in certain industries. Energy, construction, aerospace and defense is a big area for, the, for them, uh, as well as you know, manufacturing. Well, this is a segment of the uh, ERP market that often is, is under uh, is underseen. Uh, there's a lot of these companies that started out in niches, you know, PeopleSoft being a famous example, starting out in a niche of the market and then growing into other areas. And this company continues to be very focused, even after 35 years, as you mentioned, just uh, energy, aerospace, a, a few uh, construction, a few basic industries that they serve, serve them at a very deep level, uh, focused on the mid-market primarily, but they have a new positioning this year they're calling the challengers, for the challengers, which I like. It's a, it's a message that that I think resonates, it's easy to understand. They're positioning their customers as being the companies that are going to challenge the big guys in their industries. And in this time of digital transformation and disruption, you know, that's what it's all about. I think it's a great message they're bringing out this year. Well, of course I like it, because the Cube is a challenger, right? right. <laughs> Even though we're number one in the segments that we cover, we started out as a sort of a challenger. Interestingly, IFS and the you know, Gartner Magic Corner is actually a leader in field service management. They made an acquisition that they announced today of a company called Astia. Astia. Astia is a pink sheet OTC company. I mean, they're very small, it's a tuck-in acquisition. And maybe they had a they had a sub twenty million dollar market cap. They probably do twenty five thirty million dollars in revenue. Um, Darren Ruse, the the CEO, said that this places them as the leader in field service management, which is interesting. We're going to ask him about that. To your other point, um, you look around the ecosystem here. This, they have four hundred partners. I was surprised last night. I came early to sort of walk around the the hall floor. Uh, you see large companies here like Accenture. Uh, and I'm surprised. I mean, I remember the early days when we did the ServiceNow conferences, say 2013 or so, you didn't see Accenture, Deloitte, EY, PwC, now you see them at the ServiceNow event. Here, you see them. I mean, and, and I, well, I talked to Accenture last night, they said, yeah, well, we actually do a lot of business in Europe, particularly in the Scandinavian region, and we want to grow the business in the U.S. Uh, Europe tends to be uh, kind of a blind spot for U.S. companies. They don't see the size of the European market, all the activities, where some of the great ERP innovation has come out of Europe. 
Uh, this company, as you mentioned, growing three times the, the rate of the market. Uh, they have a, um, uh, a, a focus on, uh, you know, they're very tight with those customers that they serve and they understand them very well. And this is a, uh, you can see why Accenture is, is, uh, is serving this market because you know, they're, they're simply following the money. There's only so much growth left in the, in the SAP market, in the Oracle market, but as the CEO, Darren, said this morning, uh, half of their revenues last year were from net new customers. So that's, that's a great metric that indicates that there's a lot of new business for these partners to pursue. Well, I think there's, there's some fatigue, obviously, for big, long, multi-year SAP integrations. You're also seeing, you know, at the macro, we work with uh, enterprise technology research and we have access to their, their data set. Um, one of the things that we're seeing is a slowdown in the macro. Uh, clearly, uh, buyers are planning to spend less on IT in the second half of 2019 than they did in the first half of 2019, and they expect to spend less in Q4 than they expected to in July. So things are clearly softening at the macro level. They're reverting back to pre-2018 levels but it's not falling off a cliff. One of the things that I've talked to ETR about is a, sort of the premise we put forth, love to get your thoughts, is essentially we started digital transformation projects, let's say in earnest in 2016, 2017, doing a lot of pilots, started kind of pre-production in 2018, and during that time, what, what people were doing is they were, had a lot of redundancy. They would maintain the legacy systems, and they were experimenting with uh, disrupted technologies. Uh, you saw, obviously, a lot of UI path, a, a lot of Snowflake, and other sort of disruptive technology. Certainly in infrastructure, pure storage was a beneficiary of that. So you had this sort of dual strategy where you had redundancy of legacy systems and then the new stuff. What's happening now is, is the theory is that we're going into production with, with digital transformation projects and we're, we're killing the legacy stuff. Okay, we're ready to cut over we're to the new. We're not going to spend on that anymore. Right, right, we're not going to spend on that anymore. Dial that down, number one. Number two is we're not just going to spray and pray on all new tech, blockchain, AI, RPA, et cetera. We're going to now focus on those areas that we think are going to drive business value. So both the incumbents and the disruptors are getting somewhat affected by that, that slowdown and that narrowing of the focus. And so I think that's really what's happening and we're going to, I think have to absorb that for a year or so before we start to see new wave of spending. There's been a lot of spending on IT over the last three years. As you say, driven by this need, this transition that's going on. Now we're being, beginning to see some of those legacy systems turned off. The more important thing to look at, I think, than overall spending is where is that money being spent? Is it being spent on on, on servers, or is it being spent on cloud services? And I think you would see a fairly dramatic shift going on there. So the overall, the, the, the macro, I think, is still healthy for IT. There's still a lot of spending going on, but it's shifting to a new area, and they're, they're, they're killing off some of that redundancy. Well, the ETR data shows a couple things. There's no question that server and storage spending is has been declining and attenuating for a number of quarters now. Um, and, and there's a, been a shift going on from you know, that core infrastructure, obviously, into cloud. Con cloud continues its steady march in terms of taking over uh, market share. Other areas of, of bright spots, security is clearly one. Uh, you're seeing a, a, a lot of spending in, in analytics, especially new analytics. I mentioned Snowflake before, we're disrupting kind of Teradata's traditional legacy enterprise data warehouse market. The RPA market is also very hot. UiPath is a company that continues to extend you know, beyond its, its, its peers. Uh, although I have to say, Automation Anywhere looks very strong, Blue Prism looks very strong. Cloudera, interestingly, used to be the darling, is hitting sort of all-time lows in the ETR database, uh, which is, by the way, the, one of the best data sets I've ever seen on, on, on spending. Enterprise software is actually still pretty strong. Um, particularly, uh, uh, you know, Workday looks strong, uh, Salesforce still looks pretty strong, Splunk, because of the security uplift, it, it still looks pretty strong. I don't have a lot of data on IFS, like you said, they don't really show up in the ETR survey base, um, but I would expect, with the kind of growth we're seeing, a $600 million company hopes to be a billion dollars by 2020, 2021, I would think they're going to start showing up in these spending surveys. Well, uh, again, in Europe, they may, be, they may be a more dominant player than we see in the U.S. As I said, I really had not even heard of the company before last year, which was surprising, uh, for a company with 10,000 customers. But again, they're focused on the mid-market, and the mid-market tends to fly a bit under the radar. Everyone thinks about what's happening in the enterprise. There's a huge opportunity out there, many more mid-market companies than there are enterprises, and that's, a, that, that's been historically a, a fertile ground for ERP companies to launch. You know, J.D. Edwards came out of the mid-market. 
Uh, these are, are companies that may end up being acquired by the giants, but they build up a very healthy base of customers sort of under the radar. Well, the other point I wanted to make, I kind of started to about the digital uh, uh, transformation is, as I say, people are getting sort of sick of the big, long SAP, complicated implementations. As small companies become mid-sized companies and larger mid-sized companies, they, got, they look toward an enterprise resource planning you know, type of, uh, uh, of platform, and they're probably saying, all right, wait, I've got some choices here. I could go with an, an, an IFS, you know, or maybe another alternative to, to SAP. Um, you know, SAP is maybe the, maybe the safe bet, although you know, it looks like IFS has got, when you look around at the customers they have, has some real traction. Obviously a lot of references, no question about it. One of the things they've been dinged for, I saw this uh, Gartner ding them for API integrations, well they've announced some major API integrations, we're going to talk to them about that and, and, and poke at that a little bit and see if that will sort of solve that criticism that what Gartner calls caution, you know, let's see how real that is in talking to some of the customers, we'll be talking to the executives uh, and members of the ecosystem and obviously Paul and I will be giving our analysis as well. Final thoughts here uh, before Just we the, break. the challenge, uh, I think as you note, for these mid-market focused companies has been growing with their customers. And that's why you see uh, the Lawson's and the J.D. Edwards of the world. Many of these, these uh, mid-market companies eventually are acquired by the big ERP vendors. The, their customers eventually, if they grow, have to go through this transition. If they're going to go to enterprise ERP, you know, they're forced into a couple of, of big choices. The opportunity and the challenge for IFS is can they grow the, those customers as they move into enterprise grade uh, size, can they grow them with, a, with the IFS product line without having them, forcing them to transition to, to something bigger? So a lot of, here, a lot of action here in, in Boston. We heard from uh, several outside speakers. There was uh, Linda Hill from Harvard. Uh, they had a digital transformation CEO panel. Uh, uh, the CEO of SUSE, who will be on later, uh, and, PTC, and some other companies, P yep. uh, PTC, uh, uh, with Hanselman, Conway. Uh, 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 Conway, former PeopleSoft uh, CEO, was on there. And then of course, Tony Hawk, which was a lot of fun. <laughs> uh, obviously a challenger. All right, so keep it right there, everybody. You're watching theCUBE live from IFS World Conference at the Heinz in Boston. We'll be right back right after this short break. <laughs>